Imagine this fictive scenario. E.B. White approaches his editor and says, I'm going to write a bestseller, a classic. It's going to sell tens of millions of copies, be pulled as the best children's book in the U.S. It's going to be adapted into a variety of films, and it's going to win the Newbery Medal, the George C. Stone Center for Children's Book Recognition of Merit Award, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award, the Massachusetts Children's Book Award, and the Hornbook Fanfare Award. And the editor says, is that so? What's it about? And White says, oh, it's a fantasy about a friendship between an anthropomorphized spider and pig on a farm. And the only reason their friendship really develops is because this pig is terrified of being turned into bacon. And so this spider, no bigger than a quarter, tries to save the pig's life through her talents of female authorship, writing, and resourcefulness. And in the foreground, there will exist a sneering, gluttonous rat, a snobby sheep, and a goose with a speech impediment. If you were White's editor, would you have told him he was crazy or that he had a masterpiece on his hands? If you had rejected the idea and told him that he was crazy, then you would have been the crazy one. Because yes, this story about a great friendship between two beings who couldn't be more different has indeed become one of the most popular and cherished children's books of all time. And the origins of Charlotte's Web are just as interesting. White had grown up on farms all of his life, which is why the sounds and the smells and the atmosphere of the farm are so beautifully authentic in this novel. One morning, three years before the publication of the novel, White saw a spider web in his barn in Maine, the very barn that inspired the novel and still stands today. Months later, he watched the spider make an egg sack, but because he never saw the spider again, he took the egg sack with him when he had to return to New York. The story goes that he put the sack in an empty box, punched some holes in it, and left it in his bedroom. The next thing you know, hundreds of spiders were in White's home where he left them for a week or so, where they made homes all over the house on the mirrors, the hairbrushes, everywhere you can think. I can't help it, that just really grosses me out. And with that, White began this incredible story about the usefulness of spiders and the miracle of friendship, the passing of time, the desire and gratitude for life, and the idea to make the most of the time we have. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Whitney Costers, and I have been a professor of English for 20 years, and I recently started publishing my class lectures here on YouTube, hoping to share ideas about the books that continue to be talked about. So please join me by subscribing to the channel and sharing with me your thoughts about this 1952 classic in the comment section below. So what is this story about really? White himself denied any higher purpose in this book, be it literary, moral, or political, but that's just White's opinion. If you watch my lecture on Roland Barthes' The Death of the Author, then you'll know that I subscribe to the notion that an author no longer controls the meaning of the text once it's issued to the public. But I do agree with him when he says that this is a story that celebrates life, the season, the goodness of the barn, the beauty of the world, the glory of everything. And more than anything, this story celebrates friendship and what it means to be a good friend. Wilbur and Charlotte are more equals than Wilbur and Fern. It's clear that Fern, acting both as Wilbur's mother and friend, has her human limitations when it comes to fulfilling Wilbur's needs. Certainly, Fern literally saves Wilbur's life, as Charlotte will too, and she, like Charlotte, acts in a sort of maternal role to Wilbur, bottle feeding him, making up his bed, giving him hugs, love, and affection, and visiting him often after he is sent to Zuckerman's farm. But per Uncle Zuckerman's rules, Fern is not allowed to go inside Wilbur's pen. You'll notice that Wilbur and Fern become increasingly separated from one another as time goes on, whether that be because Wilbur must live at the farm now while Fern remains at home, or that Fern must sit outside of the gates of the pig pen, or because Fern matures and grows up into a girl whose interests are more focused on boys than farm animals. And oddly enough, it seems Fern can hear and understand the animals when they speak English, but she can't communicate with them. So despite the fact that Charlotte is an arachnid and Wilbur is this huge mammal, the two are far more suited for one another than Wilbur and Fern are. Friendship, and especially the one between Wilbur and Charlotte, is obviously the cornerstone of this novel, as I said earlier. But I think readers really should contemplate the sort of friendship Charlotte and Wilbur have, and if it's one that they would seek out for themselves. The friendship starts out and remains pretty one-sided. 
Charlotte, being a spider who can hide in knot holes and behind nooks and crannies, is small enough to be invisible to the rest of the world, including poor Wilbur, who becomes depressed out of sheer loneliness. Charlotte watches Wilbur, observes him, and decides she likes him. All the while, Wilbur remains ignorant that Charlotte is even there, begging anyone he can see to play with him. But suddenly, like a miracle in and of itself, she cries out to him that she will be his friend and that she will reveal herself next day. So there is a power dynamic that exists from the beginning and that will define their relationship. In many ways, Charlotte assumes the maternal and protective role that Fern began but couldn't continue. And this is fitting because what matters most to Wilbur in this moment is that he knows and feels he matters. Don't forget that he no longer has Fern, everyone has refused to play with him, and he's straight up told by the lamb that pigs mean less than nothing to me. Wilbur very philosophically proves that he understands just how meaningless this makes him, arguing nothing is absolutely the limit of nothingness. How can something be less than nothing? And this is why Charlotte is so integral in Wilbur's life. She will give her life in the service of making Wilbur meaningful, first to himself and herself, and then to the rest of the county. This difference, of course, is that while Charlotte sees in Wilbur goodness, honesty, innocence, and friendship, the people recognize that this pig has meaning, but they don't quite know what that meaning is. In their very first interaction on the day they meet, Charlotte assumes a wiser, more parental, dominant role, teaching Wilbur the meaning of the word salutations and the fundamentals of the food chain as she traps and kills flies to survive. This first lesson is followed in the months to come with lessons in humility, friendship, sacrifice, self-control, and even the hard truths of life like death and change, which we all eventually must confront. Wilbur is much like the child reader. He's naive, inexperienced, and oblivious to the injustices, the unfairness, and the grim realities about life, and he remains in the care of females until Charlotte's death. The novel depicts his growth, development, and his learning with how to cope with loneliness, fear, anxiety, and change. Because of Charlotte's no-nonsense yet kind manner, major life lessons like death and loss are never sugar-coated but always imparted both to Wilbur and the young reader with ready explanation and compassion. And this makes all the difference in the world. Unlike the sheep who dryly tells Wilbur why the farmers are fattening him up, and Templeton who cruelly says, wait till Zuckerman gets hankering for some fresh pork and smoked ham and crisp bacon. He'll take the knife to you, my boy. Charlotte teaches Wilbur that death is inevitable, though it may be delayed, and in that delay can be a remarkable world to bask in, to be grateful for. And this is exactly what we need from our parental figures and the books that we grow up with. Let's not forget that reading is not just a means of entertainment. It is an act that introduces and teaches children of places they've not been, people they've not yet met, lessons they've not yet learned. This story is a fantasy, a genre that helps children imaginatively conceive alternative ways of life, entertain new ideas, create strange new worlds, and dream dreams, skills that are vital to human survival. And equally importantly, despite the fact that readers do empathize with Wilbur's desire to live and can identify with his situation, it's still arguably easier for children to contend with the potential slaughter of a pig rather than a human facing execution. And it may be easier and more fun for children to learn from a spider who continues her maternal role in Wilbur's life and thus in our own reading moments, scolding him when he acts out of sorts, singing him soothing songs and telling him stories at bedtime, protecting him, and showing him the sort of unconditional love and self-sacrifice that we want and expect in a mother. But while that's all well and good, Charlotte says she will be his friend, not his mother. At their first meeting, Wilbur is rather horrified by Charlotte's way of life, killing flies and sucking their blood. He thinks, well, I've got a new friend all right, but what a gamble friendship is. Charlotte is fierce, brutal, scheming, bloodthirsty, everything I don't like. How can I learn to like her? New friendships are indeed gambles, but they are worth giving a chance, even though some friendships won't work out and some will never truly be authentic. Some may fade away with the passing of time and some will remain strong to the end and after. But what can come of them can be magical, fulfilling, and incredibly comforting. Even the narrator says, friendship is one of the most satisfying things in the world. 
And what Wilbur learns is that while he initially finds Charlotte brutal, she is not so out of malice, psychopathy, or cruelty. In order to survive, she must operate within the reality of life and the cycle of the food chain, both of which the naive pig will have a glimpse of in his own lifetime, but never have to face himself. Because of the farmhands, Wilbur's survival does not rely on trapping his own food. And because of Fern and Charlotte, Wilbur defies the rules of the food chain and the policies of farming. First, as the runt who survived, and second, as the pig who was too miraculous to eat. Charlotte explains to Wilbur that if spiders didn't exist, the world would be overrun and destroyed by insects. So her catching bugs is really quite useful. It is the overly sentimental and naive Wilbur who interprets Charlotte's usefulness and methods of survival as brutal. The narrator too reassures the young reader that in good time, Wilbur was to discover that he was mistaken about Charlotte. Underneath her rather bold and cruel exterior, she had a kind heart and she was to prove loyal and true to the very end. If anything, White teaches his young readers not to judge or be prejudiced against those you don't know, don't understand, that friendships can come in all shapes and sizes and differences, and that they can happen anywhere and between anyone if only we give them a chance. Now, it's in the early stages of their friendship that Wilbur is made aware of one of life's hardest truths. Death will come. It's just a matter of when. But Wilbur's death is premature. He will not die naturally in 10 to 12 years, but will be slaughtered for his ham and bacon in the upcoming winter. He is a farm animal intended to serve humans, nothing more. As Wilbur begins to cry hysterically, Charlotte tells him he shall not die because she's going to save him. And it is this promise that really defines the basis of their friendship. In many ways, I can't help but think of Shel Silverstein's story, The Giving Tree, which I also have a lecture on, so be sure to check that out. And in this lecture, I discuss the nature of giving and taking and whether this dynamic can manifest itself in acts of selfishness, greed, enabling, ingratitude, entitlement, abuse, exploitation, manipulation, and self-worthlessness. This novel similarly raises the questions of the boundaries of healthy friendship and the boundaries of both giving and taking. It's a lot of work, a lot of thinking, a lot of sacrifice for Charlotte to save this pig from slaughter. And she does so selflessly and humbly. It's no mistake that the last word she weaves for Wilbur is humble. The word adequately describes Wilbur, but Charlotte too. Charlotte always remains in the shadows of Wilbur's fame, glory, and celebrity, never once getting due credit by those who marvel over her webs. She is overlooked, ignored, and even referred to many times as common. Perhaps one of the saddest moments of the book is Charlotte's death, and not because she dies necessarily. After all, White makes plain that these are the stages of life. This is the course life takes, but that she has left her home for Wilbur's sake and hasn't the strength to return home with him, and so must die all alone in a foreign space surrounded by garbage, bottles, and emptiness. The friend who gave meaning to Wilbur, who cured his loneliness, and who drew crowds of people to the Zuckerman's farm and sparked speculation, excitement, and wonder in an entire county, dies alone and virtually unknown. While Charlotte proves to be the primary giver, Wilbur is, of course, the taker. There is a real codependency in this kind of relationship because you can't be a giver if there's no taker and you can't be a taker if there's no giver. But one could argue that it seems rather extreme in this relationship. At one point in the novel, Wilbur asks Charlotte what she's doing, to which she replies she's making something. Wilbur asks, is it something for me? And Charlotte says, no, it's something for me for a change. And when Wilbur asks about what it is, Charlotte starts talking about it. She calls it her masterpiece even. And she says she'll show him in the morning. But we're told that Wilbur is no longer listening because before she finished her sentence, Wilbur was asleep. And as Charlotte begins to show signs of weakness and tiredness, Wilbur takes no notice. So anxious and so focused is he on the upcoming trip to the fair. And when Charlotte says she may not accompany him to the fair, Wilbur, thinking strictly of himself, begs and pleads multiple times that she comes saying, but I need you, Charlotte. I can't stand going to the fair without you. You've just got to come. Not once does it cross his mind that Charlotte may have her own needs, her own problems. For the first time, Charlotte prioritizes herself, her family, and her own work. 
She tells Wilbur no several times on account of her own needs, but finally relents after much protesting on Wilbur's part, saying she will come to the fair if it's at all possible, to which Wilbur responds, oh good, I knew you wouldn't forsake me just when I need you the most. And she does ultimately go to the fair with Wilbur where she spins one more web in his service, informing everyone that he is humble. And it is this web that secures his safety from the slaughterhouse. So on one hand, this last web at the fair is part of a promise that Charlotte made to him from the beginning. And it's this crucial last step that is needed. But on the other hand, it shows how lopsided a friendship this is. So I'm curious how you interpret their friendship and how you think children see it. Is it a good example of what we should all strive for in our own friendships, or is it at risk of being seen as a friendship that is taken advantage of, exploited? Does Wilbur expect and ask too much of Charlotte? But inversely, does Charlotte offer too much and set up the very conditions that put her in this position? After all, she is the wiser, more mature, more experienced of the two. All Wilbur has ever known is being cared for, and Charlotte quickly assumes the role of caretaker from the beginning. After much consideration, I think that despite the disproportionate dynamics that exist in this friendship, it's not exploitative or unhealthy. Charlotte seems to get purpose and a sense of virtue in acting as both author and caretaker. She says, by helping you, Wilbur, perhaps I was trying to lift up my life a trifle. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little of that. She seems happy and satisfied to protect Wilbur, to be a comfort to him. And it's worth mentioning that the way in which Charlotte cares for Wilbur is primarily through language and writing, female authorship. She comforts him in words, songs, and stories, and uses her ability to weave words in her web as a means to save him. By deliberately thinking up and authoring words in her web, Wilbur gains meaning that he didn't have before. Her words are thought-provoking and spark speculation in its readers, but only about Wilbur. How exactly is Wilbur some pig? What makes him special or different? When he wins his honorary mention at the fair, it said, Many of you will recall when the writing appeared mysteriously on the spider's web in Mr. Zuckerman's barn, calling the attention to the fact that this pig was completely out of the ordinary. This miracle has never been fully explained, although learned men have visited the Zuckerman pig pen to study and observe this phenomenon. In the last analysis, we simply know that we are dealing with supernatural forces here, and we should all feel proud and grateful. In the words of the spider's web, ladies and gentlemen, this is some pig. The phrase some pig is appropriate because it invites speculation and contemplation about this seemingly ordinary farm animal. Staring at Charlotte's web for an hour, the humans wonder what makes him some pig. That's what saves him. Reading it as a divine sign from God, it would be ludicrous, maybe even sinful, to kill this extraordinary being. And what White has done here in this novel is show young readers how the public writing and the interpretation of the written word can literally change lives, mindsets, beliefs, and actions. Charlotte's authorship and her carefully chosen words have created meaning that didn't exist before, couldn't exist before. In other words, Charlotte with her web, her songs, and her comforting words demonstrates the real power of language. But what is interesting is that Charlotte as author and creator is never taken into real consideration as the miracle maker. In fact, when Mrs. Zuckerman says, it seems to me we have no ordinary spider, she's quickly dismissed by Mr. Zuckerman who says, oh no, it's the pig that's unusual. It says so right in the middle of the web. It's just a common gray spider. And that's the end of that. Later, Charlotte and her efforts in this whole supposed miracle is totally dismissed. Whence came this mysterious writing, asks the fair man. Not from the spider, we can rest assured of that. Spiders are very clever at weaving their webs, but needless to say, spiders cannot write. But spiders very clearly can write. And even though the writing is on the wall or the web really, the insignificance of a mere spider to humankind renders her unworthy even of the consideration. The only real allusion to the extraordinariness of spiders is when Dr. Dorian corrects Mrs. Arable, who remarks, I don't see why you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. Dr. Dorian, though, makes a big deal about the fact that spiders can spin webs. No human can do that, he says, and nobody taught the spiders how to do it. This is how White ensures that the miracles are, in fact, miracles to the humans. This web can't be a trick someone's playing. It's clearly either a miraculous spider or divine intervention. 
The gullible humans, as Charlotte refers to them, choose to see it as divine intervention, thereby removing Charlotte from the equation altogether. Now, why Wilbur the pig can somehow be miraculous, but the same cannot be true of Charlotte the spider is disconcerting, but yet in line with the obscurity that her character must remain cloaked in. And so Charlotte is part of a long line of female writers who wrote in the shadows of obscurity under pseudonyms and anonymity, since for so long, authorship was not considered a proper occupation for women, nor were female voices given the agency and authority of their male counterparts. But I would argue that what really matters here is that Charlotte is not obscure to Wilbur, who ultimately proves himself an equal and a good friend in the end when he tells Charlotte, you have saved me, Charlotte, and I would gladly give my life for you. This is a tremendously important statement considering the context of everything. Almost from the beginning, Wilbur's greatest anxiety has centered on his impending death, his desire not to die. His friendship with Charlotte really comes to a head when she promises to save him. And as I have made plain, this promise remains in the forefront of Wilbur's thoughts throughout the novel. I mean, so much so that it's the reason he doesn't show Charlotte the same sort of generosity in their time together. But that he would so quickly sacrifice the very thing he has been working so hard to protect is a true testament of what Charlotte has taught Wilbur about friendship and the meaning of life. And it is after her death that Wilbur really gives back to the friendship. He takes Charlotte's egg sack filled with her 514 children back to Charlotte's home where he cares for them all winter long. And remember how he even gets the egg sack in the first place by sacrificing first dibs to his food to Templeton for the rest of his life. In caring for Charlotte's egg sack and her newly hatched spiderlings, Wilbur implements the life lessons that he learned in his friendship with Charlotte and does for her children what she did for him. Though almost all of her children eventually abandon the barn, three do stay, and it is with them and their children that Wilbur shares stories of Charlotte, tells them that he is an old friend of hers, and pledges his friendship to them forever and ever. Consequently, as one critic remarks, Hope springs eternal in this novel. The narrator reassures us that as time went on, Wilbur was never without friends for Charlotte's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren year after year lived in the doorway. This movement of time and the arrival and passing of life and friendships is reflected in the changing of the seasons, the chirping of the crickets and frogs, the growth and development of Fern, and the pig who has the opportunity to live and care for his steady stream of new friends. Let me know what you thought about this novel, how you read the friendship between Charlotte and Wilbur, or how this novel impacted you as a young reader or even as an adult today. I read this book so many times as a young girl, and I saw the pretty faithful 1973 film adaptation more times than I can count. And for me, it really was a poignant yet realistic way to learn how to cope about how to cope with loss, how to be a good friend, how to grasp the fact that change, whether we like it or not, is inevitable, and we better learn how to deal with it. I would love to hear your thoughts on this book, how you read it, how you teach it, how you impart it to your own children. As always, I appreciate you joining me here today, and I would love it if you would check out some of my other lectures on children's literature, including Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, The Little Prince, Coraline, and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Take care.